Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Jakarta Tech Talk. My name is Serena, and joining us today is Grace Jensen, who will be presenting on the topic of thriving in the cloud going beyond the 12 factors. If you have any questions for Grace as we move through today's presentation, feel free to ask them in the chat or the Ask a Questions tab. Grace, over to you. Great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. I know you've all got probably very busy days, so I appreciate your time here joining me for this presentation. Uh, so, yeah, as Serena said, I'm going to be presenting on sort of how do we not just survive or sort of barely get by in the cloud? How do we really thrive within this cloud environment? And to do that, we're going to go one step further than just the typical 12 factor apps or the app methodology that many of us will probably know. And we're going to take it one step further and go towards the 15 factor app methodology. We'll take a look at each of those factors, the additional factors that have been added and what tooling we can make use of, especially in the open source Java community, to be able to enable that within our applications. As has been said, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, we'll do our best to get around to all of them uh, when we can, probably at the end of the session. If there's any I don't get around to or any think of later, um, then feel free to uh, sort of message me or reach out to me on Twitter. My Twitter handle's there on the first screen, at Grace Johnson 27 I'd be happy to answer any questions there as well. So without further ado, we'll get started. So why do we care about becoming cloud native? And I love this slide. I have no apologies for putting it in pretty much all of my presentations. It's this feeling we get. Hopefully you've seen Toy Story, so you'll get this reference. This feeling as developers of, ooh, the cloud. We get excited by the cloud because it enables us to have uh, lots of different advantages and capabilities that we didn't necessarily get when running on-prem, for example. Uh, those include things like reduced cost, increased scalability, increased speed, ensuring we have resiliency within our application in case of failure or bottlenecks, having sort of flexibility within our applications, and also sort of taking advantage of fashion. You might not think of the cloud or even IT as particularly fashionable, but really just like other industries, we follow fashions and trends, um, especially when it comes to innovations. And the cloud is one of those. It's cool and it's trendy and we want to be a part of it. So all of these benefits are why we get this feeling and this excitement and it's why we want to be effective when we're developing for the cloud and why we want to move on to it. In order to be able to actually do that though, it can be difficult to know what we need to achieve within our applications. What behaviors do we need to be introducing to be able to be cloud native? What does that term mean? So. To work that out, I went online and took a look at loads of different definitions of what does this term cloud native really mean? What does it mean for us as application developers? What behaviors and characteristics do we need within our applications to be considered cloud native? And I took all of those definitions from various different cloud providers and sort of uh, vendors who offer cloud native technologies and applications and things. Uh, and I took those definitions and sort of paired them back, took out and stripped out all of the specific language to uh, say the type of language you're coding with or the platform itself. And I stripped it back to sort of the common words, the common themes that they all talked about. And this is what resulted from that. We're trying to achieve applications that are highly observable, that are scalable and resilient, like I was talking about, those behaviors that we want, that are rapid and have great speed, um, importantly, they need to be loosely coupled. Uh, we want to achieve that sort of modern uh, or often modern sort of innovations and, and technologies. Uh, often we're using either hybrid or public clouds. So really, this is kind of the very broad sort of sweepstake of, of things we think about, things we want to be achieving to be able to be cloud native. But the question is, how do we achieve these? Because these are great words. You know, we look at them and we go, yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying to achieve. But how is the key question here? How do we go about achieving this? And this is where sort of methodologies like the 12 factor methodologies are really useful, especially because they're vendor, platform and language agnostic. That's why I particularly love this methodology. Many of you may have come across this before. Originally, it was defined by the developers over at Heroku. And it's really all about, as the name suggests, it lays out 12 factors of how to achieve effective cloud native app development. 
Um, you can visit the website if you've not already seen it. It's 12factor.net and it goes through each of these factors in detail, but we'll be taking a look at some of these in our presentation anyway, but just as reference. So the original 12 factors looked a little bit like this. Um, so we cover, you know, the, the 12 factors cover sort of end to end development right from the very start in terms of, okay, how do we get started? Where's our code base? What dependencies do we need? Working our way through to more of the DevOps side. So how am I deploying? Where are my operations within this? All the way through to sort of looking at, okay, what about things like dev prod parity? Where are my logs? What, what data am I gathering from this? Uh, admin processes and that kind of thing. So it really was designed to go from end to end and serve as sort of that underlying foundation, that introduction to the discipline of building and deploying applications built specifically for the cloud and preparing dev teams to be able to do this. Now, this was a really great start in terms of sort of laying out these foundations. However, this methodology was sort of created around a decade ago. So technology has moved on, the cloud has moved on, and our understanding of what we need for the cloud and what may, what applications need to be cloud native has also changed. And so our methodologies need to change with that. And so this original 12 factor methodology was sort of taken and edited uh, and built upon to be able to create the 15 factor app methodology. This was designed and developed by Kevin Hoffman from Dynatrace. He has a book which describes it and you can access that for free online. I put the link at the bottom here if you wanted to go into it in a bit more detail. Now, I'm not gonna make this too difficult for you. There are three additional factors, but I've highlighted them here to make it really easy to see. Um, so as well as sort of iterating upon and expanding or making the original 12 factors more specific, as you can see here, uh, for example, instead of just code base, our first factor here is now one code base, one application. So you can see we've edited it and, and iterated upon it a bit. We've also got these three additional factors, which is API first, telemetry, and authentication and authorization. So what we're gonna do in this presentation is go through um, the original 12 factors and how they've changed in this 15 factor app methodology and what technologies we can use for them. And then we're gonna spend a bit more time on the three additional factors uh, that have been introduced within this 15 factor app methodology. So let's take a look at the original 12 factors first. And I'm gonna go through some of these first ones quite quickly, just because they're probably things you're naturally doing anyway, or have done, especially if you're already involved in enterprise Java applications and creating and building enterprise Java apps. So the first one is one code base, one application. As I mentioned, the original was just code base. So what we're really doing here is we're trying to be really specific in terms of, okay, what do we mean by code base? Because you can have multiple code bases and you could have, uh, you could store them in different places and we weren't being very specific or very helpful with that title. So this, factor and the reason it's been made more specific is really to show this one-to-one -one relationship between an application and its code base. So cloud native applications should consist of a single code base that's then tracked with revision control systems. Um, and this is essentially sort of, even if you have sort of a code base, it's, it's a source code repository or a set of repositories that really share a common root and can be used to produce any number of immutable releases. So we have a one-to-one -one relationship between the app and the code base, but a one-to-many relationship between our code base and our various different deployments, whether that's production, staging, QA, DevSecOps, whatever it might be. The reason that this is important in cloud-native development is to enable proper versioning, firstly, um, to also support sort of collaboration between development and various other teams, whether you've got sort of um, teams like uh, support teams, or teams that enable you to uh, publish, for example, to production. Um, it also helps to enable much faster time to market. So how do we achieve this? Again, this is why I'm going through this one quickly. You're probably already using one of these technologies. So for example, um, Git repositories is really a great way to be able to achieve this. Whether you're using GitHub, GitHub Enterprise or GitLab, there are alternatives like Bitbucket or if you're going on uh, cloud specific pro providers, uh, so things like Google Cloud Source Repositories, AWS Code Commit. Uh, so there's lots of different ways in which we can use Git repositories, lots of different versions. This is a great way to ensure this one-to-one -one relationship. The third one, because we're skipping that additional API uh, management, we'll go, we'll go back onto that. Uh, so the third one or the second factor we're looking at is dependency management. So dependency management, this is really about the fact that sort of in classic enterprise environments, 
we're very used to this concept of sort of having a mummy server. So this is a server that provides essentially everything our application needs, and it takes care of their every desire and every whim, from satisfying the application's dependencies to providing a server in which to host the app. It does everything for them. However, as we move from sort of more traditional enterprise environments onto the cloud, our apps have to essentially mature and grow up. Um, and as such, sort of our applications can't be relying upon uh, the, the environment to take care of these needs. Um, we have to instead have the app bring their dependencies with them, for example. Migrating to the cloud um, and maturing your development practices means you have to wean your organization off the need for mummy servers. That's kind of what this factor is all about, sort of explicitly declaring and isolating application dependencies using things like a uh, de declaration manifest, for example, that could be stored within the code base, um, or using things like uh, dependency isolation tools during application in execution. Why is this important? Well, this helps to provide consistency between your various different environments, which links into another factor that we have in this methodology. It also helps to simplify setup for developers who might be new to the application and helps to support portability between cloud platforms, because no matter where you're going, you're not assuming that you're going to have these things provided for you. You're bringing them with you. You've matured in that sense. So you're, you have greater flexibility and portability, key behaviors to this definition of cloud native. Um, and in turn, what this enables is greater developer productivity because they're not having to worry about all of this dependency management themselves. So how do we do this? Well, the first thing is, you know, you have to explicitly declare and isolate your dependencies. Um, instead of packaging uh, to things like third-party libraries inside your microservice, specify your dependencies in something like a Maven or a Gradle file. So whether you're using Maven or XML or um, Gradle's uh, settings.gradle files, uh, these can enable you to be able to freely move up or down to various versions of a dependency and have a very clear manifest in which all of your dependencies are declared. So that can be a really useful tool to use. Many of you are probably already using them. Um, definitely recommend checking it out if you haven't already. The fourth one is design, build, release, run. Now, when you compare that to the original 12-factor application manifesto, what we're missing here and what we've added is this design phase. So we've added in this design step um, into this process. This is about taking a single code base through the build process to produce a compiled artifact. Um, this artifact is then merged with configuration that's external to the application to produce an immutable release. So the reason that this design phase was really um, added in is because we're no longer doing sort of waterfall development where we do all of the design at the beginning and then just go all the way through for months at a time with our development to produce the end result. We're working in a much more agile manner. And so we have to realize that as we go through development, things may change, requirements might change. So we need to be aware that our design might change alongside that. Um, so it's all about sort of designing small features that can be released often and have sort of a high level design that's then used to inform everything we do, but also knowing that that, that design might change and small amounts of the design are then part of every iteration rather than being done completely and entirely upfront. So it's important that we build this into our sort of process when it comes to creating our applications. The point of this factor is really to understand that although this is all part of one process overall, this is uh, there should be sort of strict separation between the various different stages of this process, between design, build, release, and run. The reason that this is important to note and to add into our manifesto is and to into our sort of like methodology is to prevent changes to the code and or configuration at runtime, which in turn then lowers the number of unexpected failures. It enables more effective release management and maximum delivery speed while still keeping high confidence that our application is going to work the way we expect it to. Um, it also allows us to be able to introduce things like automated testing and deployment and sort of standardization for our application. How do we achieve this? Again, you may be using tools already in terms of things like Tekton, which can be really helpful in, in offering us sort of CI, CD pipelines and that automation that I talked about. But it's important to remember that these factors aren't always specifically related just to a technology. It can also be more about the people and the organization and how we're set up as teams to be able to deliver cloud native applications uh, rather than specific technologies. And I think this factor is one of those factors that relates more to how we as teams perceive this process of development as opposed to necessarily strict technologies that relate to each one. 
So Tekton, really helpful in terms of automating that CI/CD pipeline and helping us go through this process. But it's important for us to consider these as strict and separate stages. The next one we have is configuration credentials and code. The difference between this one is that in the original factor, we just had configuration. We're now making an explicit call to credentials and code. So we're trying to be more explicit in this, in this factor. Configuration, what we mean by this really is we're referring to any value across a variety of different deployments. So whether it's your dev uh, deployment, your QA, your production. So this can include things like URLs, other information about backing services, um, information to locate and connect to databases, credentials to a third party service, or information that might normally be bundled in properties or configuration files. So the point of this in terms of within our 12 factor cloud native methodology is that again, it's about this strict separation. We should be strictly separating credentials from code. If you've got any credentials within your code, you're gonna have a massive security vulnerability. Um, and that is exactly what we're trying to avoid. We need to be storing configuration and, and um, credentials separately to our code in environmental variables. What that allows us to do is that allows us to be able to have one place to change configuration. So we're not having to go into each individual file or class to be able to change one specific factor or one specific piece of configuration. And it allows us to have that security in terms of not having credentials directly in our code. Why is this important? Well, as I said, it allows us to modify application behavior without having to make code changes within our classes. It simplifies our deployment to multiple environments or different platforms, for example, and it reduces our risk in terms of security and vulnerabilities. So how do we enable this? Well, a lot of this is about extracting away configuration, whether that be credentials or not, and allowing us to be able to store them as environmental variables. So in order to do that, we can use, for example, open source specifications like MicroProfile Config. If you've not come across MicroProfile before, definitely worth checking out. It's a great open source specification that links really well into Jakarta and actually shares some of those specifications, uh, like, for example, JAXRS, um, JSONB, JSONP. So there's lots and REST. There's lots of different specifications they share. And actually, a lot of the Jakarta EE community also work on MicroProfile as an open source specification as well. It's been designed to help people who are building microservice-based applications on Java to do that more effectively by offering things like configuration, uh, health, metrics, and a bunch of others. So MicroProfile Config is the one that I would recommend to check out for this specific factor. This allows us to be able to place configuration in properties files that then can be very easily updated without having to recompile our microservices. We can also make use of another specification, which is CDI injection, to be able to directly inject a set of properties into our application as well. So a couple of the specifications there from MicroProfile that are really helpful. The next one we have is logs. Uh, this is pretty much exactly the same as the 12 factor one. So I'm just gonna go over this really quickly. Uh, what is this factor about? It's about really sort of treating logs as event streams, logging to stood out and stood out only. Because really, when you think about a cloud native application, a true cloud native application should never have to concern itself with routing or storage of its output streams. That should be a platform concern, not a developer concern. Um, and so this factor is all about being able to improve the flexibility for introspecting our behavior over time and enabling those real time metrics to be collected and analyzed without the developer having to be concerned with that, taking advantage of the platform that we're using. Um, how do we do this? Firstly, log to stood out, stood out only. Start treating those logs as event streams and consider things like the aggregation and the processing and the storage of those logs as a, a requirement that should be satisfied, not by your application, but by your platform. We can make use, for example, uh, of tools like the Elk Stack or FluentD, uh, which can be, help us to be able to sort of capture and analyze our log emissions as well. Disposability is the next factor. Uh, this is a bit of an abstract diagram, so please bear with me with this. I am going to explain it. Um, so disposability, this is all about the fact that an application can't scale, deploy, release, and recover rapidly if it can't start and shut down rapidly and gracefully. So what we need to do is build applications that are not only aware of this, but really truly embrace it to take full advantage of the cloud. So microservices need to be fault tolerant, but they also need to be able to function under any situation and be able to deal with any potential bottlenecks or failures. So this factor is all about 
maximizing the robustness of our applications by enabling fast startup and graceful shutdown. And to do that, the mentality that we need to have when we're designing our microservices is that we need to treat our app instances and our microservices as cattle and not pets. And the reason I say that is in this example, what I'm really saying is if we have a herd or a flock of sheep or cows and one of them gets sick, so let's say one of them is not functioning as it should be, what we do is we generally, as harsh as it sounds, get rid of that particular animal. And if we need more in the herd, we replace it with a new one. Um, whereas when it comes to pets, for example, I've got Carl the cat here. I love Carl. Carl is my cat. If Carl gets sick, I take him to the vet. I look after him. I nurse him back to health if he's not functioning the way he should be instead of just getting rid of him. Um, so really what we need to do within our applications is not treat them like Carl the cat because what we're going to end up doing is having reduced functionality and resilient responsiveness of our applications for our end users, which is going to cause frustration um, and annoyances at the fact that they can't access our app or use it. What we really want is more of the cattle approach where if one of our microservices goes down, we just replace it with another one by enabling that sort of rapid uh, startup and graceful shutdown. So treat them more as cows and less as cats. Um, so and this is so this factor is really enabling our increased resiliency to potential unexpected and sudden shutdowns, bottlenecks or failures. Why is this important? This really enables us to facilitate fast and elastic scaling, uh, rapid deployment if we have things like new code or configuration changes. And it provides that robustness that we need that we saw in that original word map uh, right at the beginning of this presentation. It also enables us to be able to have things like auto scaling within our application as well to help deal with load. How do we go about achieving this? Well, uh, we need to minimize work on startup. So don't depend on things like shutdown hooks. We need to maximize robustness with very fast startup and automatic scaling. And to do that, we can use things like micro profile fault tolerance um, and fallback behaviors. So this can allow us to be able to sort of uh, code in what behavior we want if something were to go wrong within our application so that we know the, a, a very clear path of what's going to happen um, and what we expect our application to do in regards to this. So that's one specification you can use again from the microprofile specification. The next one is backing services. So backing service in this case, what I mean is sort of any service on which our application relies for its functionality. It's a really broad definition with a wide scope that is very intentional. It's kind of a catch all. It can include things like, for example, um, like databases or um, event streaming or uh, like anything that you're using for sort of to perform line of business functionality or security. So what do we mean by backing services and why is it in our methodology? Well, this is all about what we want to remember here is we need to be treating any backing services that we're using as bounded or attached resources. There should theoretically be no distinction between a local or a third party service. We should be attaching all of our resources via URLs that are stored in an app's configuration. Why is this important for cloud native apps? Well, what this allows us to do is to be able to provide loose coupling between our service and our deployment, uh, which is one of those key characteristics of cloud native applications, not having that tight coupling so that if one fails, another one will fail and we have a bottleneck or a potential unresponsive application. We're trying to avoid that. So it also means that no code changes are required if we need to update our backing service. Let's say our backing service changes or we need to change, um, sort of replace it with something completely different. It also allows operators to be able to automatically swap out services as and when they see fit as well to automate that process. It really, in total, is really what we're trying to aim here is, is to enable resiliency and agility, being able to attach and detach bounded resources at will whenever we want to. How do we achieve this? So the first thing is that mentality. Again, this is this people thing, this team thing. Treat our backing services as attached or bounded resources. Treat them the same as if you were a third party service. Microprofile configuration can help with this in terms of having that separation between code and config and having somewhere external to your, to your code base, for example, or external to your, your classes where we can store that information about sort of the URLs of where we can find and attach our resources. The next one is environmental parity. So the difference between this and the original 12 factors is that in this term, instead of uh, making this more specific, we've actually broadened this factor because we recognize that in the original 12 factor, we only specified 
dev prod parity. That implies that we only have development and production environments, when what we really know is that often we have far more deployments than this, like QA, DevSecOps, whatever it might be, staging, for example. And we want all of these environments to have parity. And what we mean by parity is really to make sure that they're as similar as possible. And that's to avoid potential issues that might come in um, that, that could potentially creep in that we don't spot in development or staging, but crop up in production because we're not using the same underlying backing services or the same systems. So we want this to be as similar as possible, um, which is why we want this parity. Uh, and to be able to do this, we really need to apply sort of a great deal of discipline and rigor to our environmental parity to keep your team and your entire organization to make sure that we have confidence that the application will work wherever it's deployed, no matter its environment. This factor allows us to reduce the risk of unexpected errors and to support our sort of continuous deployment pipeline and enables greater resiliency. How do we enable this? Um, we need to ensure we're using the same backing services for all of our deployments and ensure that we have a solid continuous integration pipeline all the way through. Deploying to production as often as possible is a great way to be able to also test this um, and automated CI CD pipelines can help with this just as we showed with Tekton earlier. We can also use things like container tools. So Docker obviously can help to make production like environments on our local machines um, to make it more accessible to us in that development stage. We can also use newer technologies like, for example, microshare testing and test containers. Test containers can be a fantastic way to be able to mimic that production environment by allowing us to have multiple different containers representing our backing services to also test that integration between our service and our backing services uh, within our application rather than just doing unit tests. So testing in a, much, in, a, in a way in which is much more aligned with our production system. If you've not checked out Microsoft testing before, I definitely recommend it. Um, test containers, Microsoft testing just uses test containers under the cover. Um, they're a fantastic source and tool to be able to achieve this sort of parity between your environments and make sure that you're testing in a way that's really close to production. Uh, there is a link at the bottom here where we have an interactive guide, which I'll be showing at the end. There's a lot of them that we have. I've been linking throughout this presentation to some of them, um, and it allows you to get hands on with this technology without needing any prerequisites on your local machine. So really handy if you're interested in trying this out, but don't necessarily want to commit to sort of uh, downloading and installing all of those dependencies locally. The next one is administrative processes. I'm going to run through this one super quick. Um, this is the same as the original factor. So this is all about running admin or management tasks as one of processes. We need to be able to store code for admin tasks within the app's code base. So things like, for example, one-off debug tasks is an example. Why is this factor important? It allows us to be able to safely debug uh, the admin of production applications and enables greater reliability. How can we achieve this? Well, Kubernetes tasks can be a great way to be able to do this. They can be used. Um, alternatively, if you're using things like uh, platforms like AWS, you can use things like AWS Lambdas to be able to do these one-off tasks. The next one is port binding. Again, this is kind of the same as the original. Um, the principle of port binding is all about sort of asserting that a service or an application is identifiable to the network by a port number and not by a domain name. This is all about enabling ops efficiency. The reasoning is that domain names and associated IP addresses can be assigned on the fly by manual manipulation and automated service discovery mechanisms. Um, so they can be changed dynamically. Um, and that's why it's important that we consider it when it comes to sort of cloud native applications if we need to change where that particular service is, which is why it's important that we assign it via a port number and not via a domain name. This is also about, again, it's similar to the other factor we were looking at, this shouldn't really be a, a, a developer concern when it comes to managing the port assignment. That should be a concern of your cloud provider because it's also likely managing things like routing, scaling, availability and fault tolerance, all of which require that provider to manage certain aspects of the network, including routing host names to ports and mapping external port numbers to containerization uh, and sort of container ports. So um, yeah, this is all about enabling that ops efficiency. How do we do this? Well, we need to be exporting services via port bindings. That's the important first step. And things like microprofile config can help with this again um, by specifying the new port in Kubernetes config map. Microprofile config can then automatically pick it up 
pick that value up and give the correct information to the deployed microservice. So a bit more automation there involved here. Again, uh, trying to ensure that portability and flexibility. Microprofile REST client can also help with this. Another of the microprofile uh, specifications. Um, REST client can help with creating client code to be able to connect from one microservice to another. The next factor is stateless processing. We've only got a couple more to go before we get onto the new ones. Um, this is all about the fact that microservices should be stateless. Um, REST is a really well adopted transport protocol and JAXA REST can be used to be able to achieve a RESTful architecture. Um, this and, and sort of systems that follow the REST paradigms are in nature stateless. So in this way, the underlying infrastructure can then destroy or create new microservices without having to lose any information uh, that might be sort of traditionally stored within that microservice. So what is this factor all about? Well, executing it at, at an app as one or more stateless processes, um, ensuring that all of our stateful data is stored in some sort of backing service. Um, and this is important because it allows us to be able to reduce deployment complexity, reduce operational complexity, and it allows for much simpler scaling um, and cloud compatibility. So again, that portability, that flexibility, and that uh, reduced complexity. How do we go about achieving this? First thing is store any stateful data in a backing service. Don't use things like sticky sessions or the local file system, please. Um, and don't use things like in-memory caches. Uh, storing in-memory cache that your application thinks is always available can actually bloat the application, making each of your instances take up far more RAM than is necessary. Um, so really what we should be doing is using things like third-party caching services. That can include things like uh, Gemfire, Geode is the open source version of that, Jcache, Redis, all of them are designed to act as a backing service cache for your application. So allowing us to remain sort of in that stateless um, state, I guess. Uh, so that's what this factor is all about. And leading on from that, factor 13 kind of relates to this concurrency. This is the same as factor eight in the original 12 factors. This is about advising us that cloud native applications should be able to scale out using the process model. There was a time originally when if our application reached the limit of its capacity, the solution was just to increase its size. So if an application could only handle some number of requests per minute, the preferred solution was just to make the application bigger. So we were creating huge, monstrous applications where we were adding CPUs, RAM, and other resources to a single monolithic application. Essentially, we were doing vertical scaling. This type of behavior is typically frowned upon uh, nowadays in our sort of cloud native environment. A much more modern approach, one that's ideal for sort of the elastic and uh, scalability that the cloud supports is to scale out or to scale horizontally instead of vertically. So rather than making a single big process even bigger, you create multiple processes and then distribute the load of your application among those processes. So this allows us to be able to scale up microservices up and down depending on the workload. So how do we achieve this? Uh, well, we need to scale out via the process model and treat our processes and, and sort of split our app into separate runnable processes to allow for that easy horizontal scaling and also allow us to be able to auto scale as well. To be able to achieve this, we can use things like uh, Kubernetes Autoscaler, uh, which is a tool that can enable us to have this sort of independent scaling and, and auto scaling. So that was the last of the original factors. Now I'm going to deep dive into the additional three factors that have been added to this methodology. The first of those is API first. So what do I actually mean by API first? Again, it's important to remember that some of these factors don't necessarily map to a specific physical requirement imposed by the cloud, but more to the habits of people and teams and organizations that are building cloud native apps. So what is this factor all about? Why has it been added? This factor is all about giving the teams the ability to be able to work against each other's public contracts without having to interfere with internal development processes. When we're designing applications, what we're usually designing is a microservice. And that microservice has to interact with a whole other network of microservices. And the way that they interact is usually through APIs. So it's all about having this sort of um, mentality, I guess, of having API as the first thing you think of in terms of what am I producing? How are people going to be interacting with the code or the functionality I'm producing? 
It's about the fact that you're building, what you're building is really an API that's going to be consumed by the client, um, either applications or services. The reason that this was added to the original 12 factors is to help avoid integration failures and to formally recognize API as a first class artifact in that development process, because it is. Because if you can't effectively interact with other microservices within your network or system, then you're not going to be able to create an effective application that's designed for the cloud, especially when we're deploying these in a distributed fashion. It also allows for greater collaboration with stakeholders. So by allowing us to be able to think about APIs first, when it comes to that, when we think back to design, that design uh, sort of process, having that design at the start allows us to be able to sort of show um, and design what our stakeholders need from each API or service, create greater documentation, and have the ability to be able to mock up that API first, to be able to vet or test the direction and, and our plans before we start investing too much time into supporting a given API that might not even be what our stakeholders need or want. It also allows us to have greater flexibility in terms of um, sort of changing that design right at the very start before we put in that, that those resources. How do we enable this? The first thing is that mentality change. We need to make sure that we're being aware that we're participants in a great ecosystem of different services and components. And we need to be aware of that by sharing a public contract for others to be able to in interact with without having to deep dive into our code. We can utilize tools for this, like for example, Open API or API Blueprint. These are both open source specifications. Um, and actually we can utilize tools that build upon these specifications. So MicroProfile Open API builds upon the Open API um, initiative uh, and is a tool that you can make use of and a specification you can make use of in your Java applications to enable you to be able to um, sort of promote and use this vendor neutral description format. Um, originally, the Open API specification was actually based on the Swagger specification, but this was donated to open source. So if you're already familiar with Swagger, you'll be familiar with the Open API format. And this really allows that vendor neutrality, that open communication of how to utilize and interact with your particular service. So this is a really, I think, fantastic step in the right direction of creating that ecosystem, working together more effectively and collaboratively in this, what can be often very distributed and complex environment uh, without people having to deep dive into my code and, and understand the nitty gritty of what's happening under the covers in my microservice. The next one that was added is telemetry. So you might be, for those of you who are really keen eyed, you might be thinking back to the original 12 factors and saying, yeah, but we already had logs in the original 12 factors. Like, why do I need to add telemetry into this as well? Well, logs are a really great start, but generally it's a tool that we use during development so we can diagnose errors and code flows. Logging is typically orientated towards the internal structure of our app rather than reflecting sort of real world customer usage. So in short, logging is how we collect data about our app when it's in the lab, you know, in our desktop, when we're in development. Instrumenting our app for telemetry, that on the other hand, is how we collect data once the app is essentially released into the wild. What's happening in reality rather than just in the lab? The concept of this isn't among the 12 factors. This has been an important addition into the additional 12, the additional sort of three factors in the 15 factor app methodology. So how do we achieve this? Well, or oh, sorry, why is this important? Why has it been added? The reason it's been added is because modern applications are more complex than ever before. These applications and supporting environments are composed of hundreds, if not thousands of microservices that are highly dynamic, distributed, and often scaling automatically to meet our users' needs. This all creates quite a complex environment that we still need to be able to understand and diagnose, especially if anything were to go wrong. Especially because applications nowadays are more important than ever. Almost all companies have applications that are mission critical. If these applications aren't monitored and our performance degrades or crashes, revenue is potentially at stake um, and possibly things like bad press, call outs on social media, et cetera. So our customers expect more features more rapidly, but in a safe environment where they can still monitor all of this and understand how our application is behaving in real time. Um, and we need to be able to provide real time feedback to be able to quickly understand um, how our application is behaving um, and sort of also if we're, if we're releasing features to understand how our customers are reacting to that feature and if its performance is optimal. Um, this factor is also about sort of having that 
I guess, auditing and monitoring real time in the cloud in this distributed environment. So it is a really important addition on top of logging into the into our methodology of how to build cloud native applications. How do we achieve this? Microprofile metrics and health are two specifications from the microprofile community that can really help with this. Health providing sort of information as to whether our microservice is up or down, depending on uh, particular performance factors that you can determine. And metrics is a wide variety of different metrics that you can collect that have already been sort of enabled through the specification from your microservices to really monitor how it's behaving in real time, potentially identify bottlenecks, failure points, and be able to act on that immediately or as soon as possible. The last and final factor I'm going to go over is this last edition, which is authentication and authorization. What really shocked me when I actually reflected back on the original 12 factors is the fact that there is absolutely no discussion of security within those 12 factors. Um, and as we know from recent events like Log4Shell, Log4J, security is a really vital part of any application, especially cloud native applications. Security should really never be an afterthought. So it's important that it's included within cloud native methodologies. A cloud native application particularly has to be secure because you know, your code, whether it's compiled or raw, is transported across many different data centers and it can be executed within multiple containers and accessed by countless clients. Some of those will be legitimate, but many will often be nefarious. So it's important that we're considering security uh, really at the forefront of our development. In an ideal world, uh, what we'd be doing is and securing all of our endpoints with things like RBAC, so role-based access control. Um, so for every request for an application's resource, we'd know who was making the request and the role to which that customer belongs and whether that role allows them to be able to have sufficient permissions to access or honor that request. Um, so that's the first thing we can do is enable um, securing our endpoints through RBAC. Uh, and to be able to do that, we can use tools like, for example, OAuth2, OpenID Collect, Keycloak. Um, there's also specifics to different platforms like Azure Active Directory, uh, IBM App ID. But we can also make use of open source specifications like MicroProfile again here. Um, so MicroProfile has a specification called MicroProfile JWT. It stands for JSON Web Token. And this allows us to be able to authenticate and authorize and verify users. So again, allowing us to have that RBAC verification, securing our endpoints, and enabling that instead of having access for everyone or access for no one, we can really have a very distinct, clear uh, roles and sort of different levels of access, depending on what people really truly need, rather than over uh, allowing them to access overly uh, over what they need or under. Um, so this is a really important factor and something that everyone should be considering. Security should be at the forefront of our application development, especially in the cloud. So now that we've taken a look at these 15 factors, uh, let's take a look at what it would be like if we mapped it onto a development process. So here we have either a public or a private or a hybrid cloud, whatever you're using. Uh, we've got some backing services in there. We have our application with various different microservices. We also have this arrow, which is sort of loosely representing our delivery pipeline. Um, and sort of we have the repositories where we're going to be pulling artifacts down from or publishing artifacts too. When we start to map out our 15 factors, we can start to see where in this process they come into play and how they're all important as we go from end to end, right from the start of development, all the way through to deployment and monitoring in ops. And then what we can see from this is actually what it enables is some of those key factors that we were talking about that really are characteristics of cloud native applications that we need to have if we are to be building effective cloud native applications um, designed for the cloud. So being able to have this rapid deployment um, and rapid building of our microservices, scalability, observability, having that loose coupling between our microservices and that re resiliency and robustness as well. And to achieve that, as I've shown, there's loads of different uh, sort of tools and technologies that you can make use of. And this is sort of where some of them would map onto in this mapping of sort of our development pipeline um, and our deployed application to see, you know, there are lots of ways in which we can enable these factors. We can enable these behaviors um, through open source specifications. If, as I mentioned, you want to get hands on with any of the technologies or open source specifications that I've mentioned throughout this presentation, we do have our interactive cloud native labs. So uh, these all stem from our open liberty guides. 
If you've not come across Open Liberty before, uh, worth checking out. It's a great uh, open source cloud native runtime that really allows some fantastic features like uh, dev mode. So being able to rapidly iterate upon your code and see those changes in real time allows things like instant on. So being able to have that's based on cryo or crack checkpoint restore. Uh, so it's about being able to have near serverless speeds when it comes to uh, startup time, which can be a great advantage. And really, the key part here is that it's open source and it, it supports all of the specifications and technologies I've been talking about. It's really involved in the community. In fact, many of the guys who develop Open Liberty are actually the specification leaders for MicroProfile and Jakarta EE. So definitely an open source runtime that you should take a look at. Um, the nice thing is we have over like 50 or 60 guides, I think it is, that you can check out that are introducing you to different technologies and specifications and, and APIs. Um, you can see we've got categories for them. So if there's one you're particularly interested in, then check it out. I've added some links throughout this presentation that link off to some of these. You can either choose to do these guides locally. So if you really want to do them on your own machine, you absolutely can. Just bear in mind that you will need some prerequisites and they're listed on the top right of each guide. Environment. So this is all browser based. So all you need is a browser, uh, preferably something like Chrome or Firefox. Um, but most browsers should work for this. Um, it's loosely based off the open source IDE of Thea. Um, and essentially what you have here is the instructions on the left hand side. You've got the IDE on the right and the terminal at the bottom. So everything you need is within one UI. So it's really easy to be able to use. Uh, we've actually added new functionality into this that allows you not only to copy the commands that we put in the instructions, but you can also automatically execute them within your terminal in our newer version as well. So it's super straightforward to get started with this. Um, you do need to log in. That's sadly because we had we did have it originally open, and then we had Bitcoin miners come along and ruin that for everyone. So now you do need to sign in, but you can sign in with a wide variety of social logins, um, like for example, LinkedIn, Google, um, or you can just uh, create an account with an email address if you'd like to. So definitely worth checking out. These can take like 20 minutes-ish, 15 to 20 minutes for each lab. So really not a huge amount of time, and it can allow you to be able to get really quickly hands on with these technologies and discover whether it's right for your application in a safe environment that's easy to use. So yeah, I would recommend taking a look. We're very proud of this environment. So if you do use it and you love it, please let us know because we'd love to have your feedback on it. Um, same for any of the guides as well. The link is at the top here. So to summarize, um, hopefully what I've shown you throughout this presentation is that the 12 factor applications were a great start, but to really thrive in our cloud environments, we need to be looking beyond those 12 factors to methodologies like the 15 factors, or maybe even further in the future. And unfortunately, guys, there's no excuses. There are so many open source tools and technologies that are available to help and communities backing them that have lots of different FAQs, answers, and communities to help you use them. So an action that I'd like you guys to take away from this presentation is evaluate your own applications against these 15 factors and consider what you could do to enable any of them that you don't already to truly thrive within that cloud environment and become truly cloud native. Just in case I haven't given you enough resources throughout this presentation, I've got a couple of slides here that I've categorized into different sections based on the factors that you can go and check out if you want additional information about any of this. So general resources, um, ones on design, build, release, run, logging, uh, stateless, concurrency, security, and also we've got the Open Liberty tools, which are our tools that allow us to be able to um, offer really easy IDE use uh, when you're using Open Liberty for your application. It's available on, on uh, Visual Studio Code, IntelliJ, and on Eclipse as well. Uh, again, all open source, and we're always looking for feedback. So if you do use them, feel free to let us know. We also have social media. I run the social media, so we'd love to say hi to you all. So if you do want to find out more news, um, when we produce new guides, for example, or new demos, um, code demos and repositories, then feel free to follow us on either LinkedIn or Twitter or both. Uh, we'd love to connect with you guys there. So with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for spending the time to be here with me and joining me for this presentation. Um, and now I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Grace. <clears throat> so it, just a reminder in the audience, um, if you have any questions, to put them in the Ask a Questions tab or in the chat. We're happy to address them. Um, so I'll give you a few moments to do that uh, as before I wrap up. 
And we're also looking for um, some more Jakarta Tech Talks. So if you have something great to share with us, uh, please, uh, I will provide you a link in the chat as well. So kindly click on the, on the link and fill out the form and we'd love to have you. So let's have a quick little. I'll also share the slides. Um, so if anyone wants the slides, I will be sharing them um, on, I think I'm, I'm gonna, I'm using speaker deck now. I've switched, I've made the switch. <laughs> um, so it will be on speaker deck and I will be posting on my social media with some links. So feel free to check that out if you want, if you want slides. Amazing. So it doesn't look like we have any questions, Grace, but I want to thank you again uh, for your time today and the excellent presentation. And you all have an amazing rest of your day. Take Thanks care. Thanks so much, guys. Bye.